Okay, so this is what we're looking at the value of courage. Mm. What does it mean to have a value of courage? When I see someone being courageous or when we see people being courageous, it's like, I love that. And I think it puts courage into other people as well when someone is bold and takes a risk or takes steps out in faith. People can think, oh, I'm not very courageous. I'm afraid of things all the time. I think that's a prerequisite to being courageous yeah. is you have to be afraid because otherwise you're just confident, you're not courageous. Uh, maybe that's a little bit harsh, but if you're afraid of something and then you do it, that's, that takes courage. And so things like sharing your faith or perhaps praying out loud in front of a group of people or sharing something on a Sunday morning or in a prayer meeting, that kind of thing, those things take courage. And actually by doing them, you then grow in your confidence and you can actually do them again. An area where I know God wants to say, look, I want to come against fear. Yeah. And therefore, you know, you'll, when we talk later about sort of the Bible references, there's often things about be, be courageous in the face of fear because fear will stop you moving forward. So you want to be courageous, you want to have courage. Yes. So where in the Bible might we find examples of courage or instructions to be courageous? Yeah, I think, um, it's often during times of transition or when someone is sort of growing in their leadership. So you look at um, Joshua as he's sort of taken over from, from Moses and he's, he's sort of leading the people into the promised land. I think in Joshua 1, it's, it's sort of several times God says to him, hey, be strong and courageous. And then it's a few lines, I told you, be strong and courageous. When Paul's writing to Timothy, he talks about you haven't been given a spirit of fear, but you've been given a spirit of, of boldness and love and power. And so actually there's lots of times, well, anyway, really where someone is sort of starting something new or going into something where they might be a bit afraid. God is very much encouraging. You need to be courageous in this. God kind of comes alongside people in times of, so Joshua is a great example, you know, I've promised you this. But you're going to need to, you know, what's stopping you get, getting there is your fear, you know, of these things. I'm, so I'm going to come alongside you, be strong and courageous. I'm with you. Let's go. We're going to take you and eventually you're going to end up with the promises. We've got the, um, the example of um, Peter, which uh, in the Bible of kind of the story of he's, he's afraid of the, this little slave girl who's asking him, you know, do you know Jesus? And, I'm, and then, then you look at him in Acts 2 and suddenly he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he stands up and says, men of Judea, and he gives this really kind of like, that took incredible courage of what's the difference? Holy Spirit came and helped him do what he wanted to do and what he'd been commissioned to do and what God wanted him to do. Yeah. And so at a practical level, what does courage look like in the church? It looks like sharing your faith with people. It looks like actually having the courage to go, yeah, I'm a Christian, which I think is becoming increasingly difficult. I think it's, it's about responding to God, isn't it? God said, do this thing. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it then. We wanna be a church of like third chances, which is not you only get three chances, but try something. If it messes up, that's okay, doesn't matter. You can try again. If you mess it up, that's okay, you can try again and then stop. No. But, uh, <laughs> three strike. Yeah. We want the default position to be, God said this, I'm going to go for it, rather than, oh, I, I might not be allowed to do that. Particularly if no one else is doing it, then you're sort of finding your way in the dark almost. We want to sort of support people in that and say, actually, you're not going to be doing this on your own. You can be encouraged by having a church behind you doing that. The food bank's a fine example. I mean, the first person who did that yeah. was probably had to approach supermarkets who were like, sorry, but we don't give our food away. It's like, well, I want you, you know, that takes yeah. courage to initiate and actually stand in front of people and say stuff and they're looking at you thinking, well, what, what? This is, that's weird. You're thinking, well, yeah, food bank probably was. If I do something, it doesn't go well. Our kind of honoring culture would be to come up and say, listen, let me just kind of encourage you with that. But hopefully in a, in a culture where you've got truth as well as another value, I can talk to you and say, but if you're going to do that again, let me just suggest a few things that yeah. might help, you know, again, and you're hoping that all kind of coming together means that, yeah, no, I'm not fearful. I'm kind of, I'm going to give it another go. I can now be more courageous. And now I'm not just going to sing. I'm going to read a bit of a scripture before I start. And actually I'm going to write a song. Overcoming a lot of the fear that's now prevalent in our culture is, which is predominantly fear of losing face. Mm. 
the fear of embarrassment, the fear of speaking out of turn, the fear of saying the wrong thing, the fear of, like Aaron said, just saying I'm a Christian in the workplace and someone saying, so you must have these views. And you're thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't said anything. You're thinking, well, that's fear now. What you've got is you're, you're, you're fearful of your image or how you're perceived. You're going to need courage. Otherwise, what you're going to do is really clam up on everything um, and not be able to speak truth. Sometimes courage is, is needed when you're in dire straits, to be honest. Um, not the band. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying and he's going, oh, take this cup from me, God. But if not, then your will be done. And so I think some of the most courageous people are people who, you know, they're, they're really unwell, they're in constant pain, they're suffering, but they're saying, but I know God is good. So I think it's that everyday courage as well yeah, we want to try absolutely. and encourage people in. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's been very helpful. Um, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Okay, so courage. There we go. Such like clue. There we go. So this is our, as most of you will know, we're going through the, the eight values that as a church we value real priorities for us. And uh, this is, I think, about number seven. And we're looking at the subject of courage. And our church has this, this statement. Building a culture of courage. We choose. There's some action involved. And as I share a few thoughts with you this morning, it is about taking some action and doing something. We choose to follow God in the adventure of faith. We speak and act in a way that makes it clear he alone is Lord of our lives. We put aside our reputation and personal comfort to obedient to the call of God. So, courage. I'm just going to cover it in a few. Hopefully this, uh, that's better. I'm going to give a few thoughts on what is courage? Who shows us courage? How do we get courage? And how do we develop and use courage? So they're just four sort of simple points. They might not be simple to put into action, but let's see where God leads us. So what is courage? Saying something hard or brave? Have you ever said, I couldn't do that? I couldn't go there. Well, sometimes we need to. It's quite difficult, but it's very easy. And I've done it myself. I couldn't do that. Someone gave one of these talks a few weeks back, and I said, well, I couldn't have done that. Acting bravely or courageously, doing something which is perhaps out of our comfort zone, going somewhere which we feel about, uncomfortable about, Helping someone in need. It's so easy to leave it to someone else. I'll touch on that a bit later. So what does the Bible say? We had a couple of suggestions in Aaron and Andy's uh, conversation. But let's refer to a few. There we go. So Deuteronomy... Got someone's music here. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 7. And Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of everyone, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. That, the two come together, and they're quoted quite often in the Bible. For you must go with this people into the land that the Lord saw their forefathers to give them. You need to be strong and courageous. This was quite a challenge for Joshua as he was given these instructions. And sometimes God says to us, be strong and courageous. 
In Matthew, we read these words. In Matthew 14, and verse 27. Jesus was walking across the water towards the disciples and they, were, they didn't quite know what was going on and who it was. And Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Not this sort of hit his eye, it is me, Jesus. Jesus has promised to be with us at all times. We sang in one of the songs, you know, yesterday, today and forever, at all times, Jesus is promised to be with us. Take courage. Jesus is never, never, never going to ask you to do something, to go somewhere on your own. Because he's promised that whatever he calls you to do, wherever he calls you to go, that he will be there with you. In Acts chapter 4, we have the situation with Peter and John. They've recently healed the lame man. And they've been giving a bit of a hard time. And I've said verse 13, but perhaps just a little bit before that. Peter says, filled with the Holy Spirit, rulers and elders of the people, if we're going to be called to account today for the act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed... Then know this, you and everyone in Israel, it is by, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. I mean, he's getting into courageous words here, isn't he? He's sort of pointing the finger at the people who, who did it and said, you crucified him, but in his name, I, made, I prayed and the man was healed. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven. This is a fantastic verse. Under the pressure and the, everyone has got their eyes on Peter and John at this point, they're being told off for, for healing someone and he says there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And they saw, it says in verse 13, I've got there eventually, the courage of Peter and John. They were unschooled. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13. This is one of Paul's final encouragements. He's in the last chapter of this letter to the Corinthians. He's giving a few words of, words of advice. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men and women of courage. Be strong. He obviously thought that was really important to say to the uh, church in Corinth to be strong. Take courage. Just want to refer back to Isaiah. There we go. I'll just read this verse in Isaiah. Chapter 11. And verses 2 and 3. And uh, Isaiah is prophesying here about what Jesus will be like. I'll read from the beginning of that chapter. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, so a descendant from Jesse, from David. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So in talking about Jesus, Isaiah is saying he will have wisdom and understanding, wise counsel and power, fortitude or courage. Is that what we would expect? It's a key part of what 
uh, Jesus Christ demonstrates for us. And it's a key part. That's why it's one of our values. That, that having courage is something which God endorses. It has his stamp of approval. Who shows us courage? Any suggestions? Any, who can you think of in the Bible that uh, stands out as being courageous? Any, any offers? David. David. Daniel. 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 Okay. Joseph. Joseph. Okay. Yeah. Moses. Moses. Exactly. Anyone else? Abraham. Abraham. Esther. Esther. You've got to be pretty brave to go and do that, Nehemiah. The list is probably endless. It's probably every person who wrote a book. That gives us, it's not 66, but quite a lot. <laughs> there are so many good examples. We mentioned a number. And we mentioned a number who, when they were called to actually stand up to the plate, were quite elderly people. Someone mentioned Moses. Most of us, I guess, know the, the history that you know, Moses was 80 years of old when he saw that burning bush. And God said, go and lead my people. Go and take two million people and pop them down the road for 40 years. He was 80 years of age. I'm going to focus on someone who was my hero. And it's Daniel. And I would like to read uh, from Daniel chapter 6. It's the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And the first 23 verses. Sometimes when you turn to these passages of Scripture, you think, well, where, where do I start and where do I stop? Um, and I don't want to just carry on reading it forever and ever, but I want to read this passage um, in Daniel from verse 1 to verse 23 of Daniel 6. So Daniel is, is now a, an elderly man, and he's, he's got a, quite an important job uh, in the captive area where he is. It, it pleased Darius to appoint 120, this is a strange word, but it's in the uh, NIV as well, satraps or governors to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. He was one of the top three guys. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. They were trying to catch him out, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. I wonder when we have our assessment at work, is our boss able to say they were neither corrupt nor negligent, totally trustworthy? He, he had achieved uh, a good standing Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it is something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned the decree had been published, When Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened to Jerusalem and three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed 
giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king, spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or man except you, O king, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians and cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention. O king, pays no attention to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He quite liked Daniel. He was determined to rescue Daniel, made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king and said, Remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order. They brought Daniel and they threw him in the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it in his own signet ring and the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he couldn't sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lion's? And Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel. He shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because... He had trusted in his God. So this is not just a nice story. It is a nice story. But it's actually happened. Daniel was actually put into a pit where there were lions. Has anyone ever tried to catch you out on your faith? Ever been teased about loving Jesus? Someone ever said to you, you're going to come along to, uh, come along to the football match on Sunday morning? Oh, I can't make Sunday morning because I want to gather to worship my God. Coming to the pub on Wednesday evening, explore night for most it's a challenge when someone asks us to do something when we are intending to do something specific for God, be that go to church or meet with other Christians or whatever. What do we do? Do we have the courage? God has promised to give us that courage. I'm not saying it's always easy. I'm not saying that I've never found that difficult. I'm just saying we need sometimes to stand up and say, Yep, I believe in the living God. When I was a young boy, I used to sing a song which was around at the time. You'll know that's a long time ago. But it was, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, and dare to make it known. I could sing you all the verses. <laughs> And I found this this week, I was just doing a bit of preparation uh, about Tony Benn. Some of you will remember that he was uh, a very able politician. And I'm not debating his politics, but as an individual, he was uh, very honourable in my opinion, uh, very true to his convictions. And he was interviewed on the radio and uh, Tony Benn's great-grandfather was a congregational minister. 
his mother a Bible scholar, and he was reared on stories of conflict between kings and prophets who preached righteousness. My dad said to me when I was young, said Tony Benn, yeah, this was an interview in 2005. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. And dare to make it known. It takes courage to stand alone sometimes. But God calls us to do just that. It, it isn't always times of real difficulty. We're not under the cosh the whole time. But sometimes we have to step up and be prepared uh, to say what our faith is. As I mentioned, when Daniel was put into the lion's den, he was by then over 80 years of age, been in captivity for some years. The administrators try to catch him out, try to stop him praying. I paused when I was reading that passage. When he knew what the, the rules were, what did he do? He went to his bedroom, he got on his knees and he was praying to his God because he knew that that wasn't allowed but he knew his God was more important. Daniel didn't panic. He continued faithful to his God. The point of this story, this episode, this event that took place is not about Daniel's wisdom or his bravery, although he had both. But he recognised that God was in control and he acted accordingly. And that's the real challenge for us is to recognise that in our life God is in control and we need to try and act in his grace, in his power, but to act accordingly. What did Daniel do? Did he complain? Did he start a protest? Did he appeal to the king? He got a good relationship with the king. No, he carries on and he prays to his God. Daniel is released. His accusers are put in the lion's den and they are killed. And the king acknowledges Daniel's God. That section of Daniel finishes with uh, the king acknowledging Daniel's God. Let me tell, me tell you about a friend of mine called Samuel. This is Samuel. The other one's me. I met Samuel in Uganda in 2011 and we've been in regular contact ever since. He's a Christian man, a man of great courage. Uh, Samuel was visited the UK first time for a long time uh, recently and I met up with him last week as you can see and uh, we spent some time together. Samuel's home is in eastern Uganda, not too far from the Kenyan border. So some of you may, have, may know that sort of area. In 2006, when Samuel was actually away from home, the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, who were attacking that area of Uganda at that time, attacked his home and shot his wife. And he was left with four children. And he was not the only one. I mean, thousands were killed in that way by the LRA in that area of Uganda and uh, the countries nearby. So what did he do? Uh, and I mention this because I see this as a real act of courage. As I say, a godly man. He started a project to provide food and income for the local people mainly widows, because the majority of the people who were shot were men, although there were many women as well. When I went in 2011 um, with the Rope Charity, we went to 
visit Samuel and to see if this project that he had just started, literally just started, uh, was worth getting behind, supporting, and giving them some, some help. And we decided that we would do that. We felt that God's saying, yeah, this is the right, the right thing to do. And Rope has supported that project ever since. And we initially started and we funded 100 widows in growing ground nuts, what we call monkey nuts. These. This is a huge container. It took four of us to lift the lid on. Uh, but they were growing these monkey nuts, ground nuts. And when harvested, they would provide income for food and for education and a way to live. Now, seven years later, there are 1,281, Samuel tells me, families uh, who have been supported through this project, 300 of which are totally self-sufficient. They don't need any help at all uh, because they've started, they've grown more. Not only are they growing ground nuts, they're growing other vegetables. They've got uh, fruit trees. They've got livestock. It has just blossomed. Their current project is called Tithe to Thrive. The idea being, if God blesses you, give something back. And he tells me they've opened up a new bank account for those who have been blessed to put extra money into to help uh, the next phase of people who will be supported. I think that's an amazing story of of one person. And just put ourselves in that situation. We're not in Samuel's situation, but we're all in our own situation. There's always there's opportunities in our lives. Sometimes an opportunity is laid before us, but sometimes we have to go and do something ourselves. No one told Samuel what to do. He, he set up what is called Youth Action Uganda, and now he's got nine people on the payroll, as I say, thousands of people. So how do we get courage? Let me just read this verse in John 14. A familiar verse. But in John 14, verses 13 to 14, Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do. So that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask anything, and I will do it, says Jesus. We ask God that he will give us courage, and then we need to exercise it. It's true of all of the gifts that God gives us. If we just say thank you and sit on our backside and don't do anything, then that gift will wither. But as we exercise it, so our courage, we, so we become braver, stronger. About 50 years ago, I was going out with the lovely Jill. And we were considering whether this should become a long-term relationship. And, uh, well, you know the answer to that, I guess. <laughs> But we agreed to pray about it. And a little time later, I said to Jill, I feel God has led me to a verse. To which Jill said, I think he's led me to a verse as well. So we were both led to the same verse, which has already been mentioned today, in Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, where Joshua is told, Be strong and courageous. I, I will read it. It's well thumbed in my Bible. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. This book. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. This book. 
then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. It's not a promise to be rich. It's not a promise that everything's going to be rosy. It's not a promise that you'll have everything you want. It's a promise that God will be with you. Be strong, be courageous. Do the things which I lay before you. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes they're pretty difficult. And I will bless you. How do we develop and use courage? We need to use and develop each gift, as I, as I mentioned. Just like the servants who were given talents in Jesus' story, you can't just bury it. You've got to use it. Let me give you an example in, in my life briefly. My, my parents had a corner shop, a sweet shop, uh, fairly close to a few factories which were along the other side of the road. And... Uh, when I was about eight, so I used to help my dad uh, with the cash book. So on a Sunday night, sorry, it's, it's the uh, pressy thing, he's got it slightly out of sync. But on a Sunday night, he would write up his cash book for the takings from the previous week. Sunday we were closed. Monday, perhaps nine pounds. Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday was half day closing, so not very much. Friday, Saturday. And I can assure you, it does add up to £75. And I used to write all these numbers in my little cash book, and I would add them up and see if I could beat my dad in uh, doing that on a Sunday. Ten years later, I was working as an accountant. Most of you know that I have a financial background. I was working as an accountant with a very large cash book. Solicitors traditionally had very large cash books, and some days I would spend the whole day from nine in the morning <laughs> till six at night checking the additions in the cash book. I'm quite good at adding up. <laughs> Ten years later, I found myself be being responsible for working out the cost of a set of brakes for an airplane. These, this is actually a 757, but they're exactly the same as Concorde brakes. And we made the Concord brakes uh, for the very first time. It took nine months to make. And I, in the mid-70s, a set of brakes was £150,000. One set of brakes. And they wore out just like brakes do today. Ten years later or so, I found myself at British Home Stores going around and teaching every store manager how to produce a budget for his store. And in those days, every store made a profit. <laughs> ten, sorry. ten years later, I found that I was managing hundreds of millions of pounds. Then ten years ago, I found myself in a meeting at my, our previous church. Uh, there were two of the church elders, two of the church leaders and me, and on the other side, there were three directors from Carla Homes. They make houses. They build houses. And they'd invited us to get together for this meeting. They were planning to build some houses, 85 houses, um, in Amersham. And they wanted to know if we, as a church, were interested in building a new church on this same site. Which we were very interested We'd been looking actually for some years because we'd had some prophetic, this was mentioned earlier, some prophetic words from God that there would be a church set on the hill. They then asked, how much would we be prepared to pay for this piece of land? Uh, it was about 20% of their site, so it would cost them something in excess of a million pounds. This was the point when you step up and take courage because God's equipped you to do what he wants you to do. 
I was the finance person. I spoke up. We will build a great church, but we're not willing to give you any money for the land. At our next meeting, it was all agreed that Carla Holmes would provide the land for free and we would build a beautiful church. We all have gifts given by God. Some here are brilliant musicians. Brilliant musicians. Some here are excellent teachers. There are some who drive trains, manage businesses, a whole range of skills. How do we use those skills? We use them, they enable us to have a purpose and be fulfilled. That's important. They give us gifts and enable us to develop them. But they also give us gifts to use to help and to serve God and to bless him when the need arises. We just need to be ready for when the challenge comes. Help. There we go. And when the challenge comes, what do we do? Do we keep quiet and keep our head down? Do we say nothing and hope someone else speaks up? Do we turn the other way and hope the problem goes away? Do we cross to the other side of the road? Or do we just not put our name on the list? Or we can do what God has prepared us to do, to just do it. What did they do? Moses, as mentioned earlier, went to Pharaoh and the Israelites were freed. Daniel prayed to his God and saved from the lions. My friend Samuel set up a charity and 1,200 families are now well provided for. My previous church has a new home and are reaching many for Christ. And your neighbour, your friend, your work colleague is waiting for you to just take that opportunity when they arise to speak up for him. God invites us to be strong and courageous. Will you accept the challenge? Will you serve the King of Kings? I hope that something that I've shared will just encourage you, prompt you to do those things which God has for, for you to do. I've shared some of the things that have happened in, in my life. Yours will be different it, it's not a matter about size. It's not a matter of whether it's a big thing or a little thing. That's irrelevant. It's will you do the thing that God wants you to do?